Hello and welcome to Chawton House's Lockdown Literary Festival. My name is Cleo O'Sullivan. I'm the Communications and Public Engagement Manager at Chawton House. And here with me now is B. Rolat, who is journalist, campaigner, writer, author, everything, spearheaded the Mary on the Green campaign uh, to get Mary Wollstonecraft's statue up in London. So B, it is so lovely to see you again and to chat about Mary Wollstonecraft. Thank you very much for having me. It's lovely to be back virtually in Chilton House. Oh yeah, and when Bee came to visit, she gave a talk and was so engaging and it was wonderful to have her there. So those of you who are tuning in probably know a fair bit about Mary Wollstonecraft, that she's sort of lauded as the matriarch and mother of feminism and know about her vindications maybe, maybe even know that she's the grandmother of Frankenstein, that her daughter wrote Frankenstein. But there's one thing you may not know about her, about her travels in Scandinavia and what brought her there. So Bee's going to tell us about that and how it inspired her own book. If you like. So what she has here is a series of letters. You can see my copy is just a very, very well loved edition. Yeah. It's a series of letters to some unnamed friend who is, of course, her estranged lover, the father of her child and proper ne'er-do-well Gilbert Imlay, who uh, she shacked up with in Paris in the teeth of the Reign of Terror. They had a baby. He then ran off with an actress, uh, leaving poor Wollstonecraft and her baby destitute. Um, so the backstory of this book is a really, really juicy one. Basically, she was still in Paris with the baby, and it transpires that her dodgy boyfriend, Gilbert Imlay, has been smuggling. Um, he's an American in Paris, so as an American, very simpatico with the aims of the revolution and with the local administration. Um, and this gives him access. And on the face of it, he's transporting goods in and out. Um, of course, the crowned heads of Europe are at war with revolutionary France, and he's trading um, silver and goods taken from the aristocrats. He's trading with neutral Scandinavia, or so they think. Um, it turns out to be a lot darker than that. Wollstonecraft um, has a sense, at the beginning of the book, she's got a sense that there's something going along, but things darken throughout the course of the, of the letters that she sends back. And the nub of it comes in the winter of 1795, when Gilbert Imlay has sent off, has loaded and sent off a shipment of silver, fleur-de-lis, aristocratic silverware, loads it into a ship with a Norwegian called Peter Ellifson, and it goes away and it vanishes. Mm. And uh, of course, what can a chap do? Here he is trying to ditch this very tiresome woman, Wollstonecraft, but she is also quite a force of nature. So he decides to harness this force of nature. And she's, of course, now a well-known international celebrity, having penned Vindication of the Rights of Women and being celebrate, of women and being celebrated around the world, uh, Western world. Anyway, he says, you know, will you find my silver love? Off you go. And why not take the baby? And, you know, as a, <laughs> I'm not sure what most people would say to an offer like that, but Wollstonecraft, of course, says yes. And baby under one arm, off she goes on what effectively is a treasure hunt. That's what the book is. You, you recreate Mary Wollstonecraft's journey through Norway, though, don't you? Yes. So having been hooked in by, by this extraordinary detail, the, I mean, it's, it's the, this, the book itself is, an, is a wonderful piece of literature, but it was the story behind the story that, that just sunk its hooks into me. And uh, I actually, I mean, I read it first time many, many years ago, but never forgot about it in the way that some books stay very deeply inside you. Um, it was actually just after having my fourth kid, that I remember feeling particularly a sort of shrinking of my horizons and just thinking, oh, you know, I'm just buried in a world of Weetabix and Lego. Will I ever <laughs> emerge from these four walls? A little bit like lockdown. You know, mm -hmm. bit, uh, my world just felt like it shrunk. And I remember thinking, well, hold on a minute, how the hell did she do it? How did Wollstonecraft take a tiny baby, 11 months old, um, and go off on what was effectively a, a treasure hunt, a series of wobbly boats, coaches overturning, encounters with all kinds of different people in various countries, uh, whilst trying to hunt down a, a missing shipment of silver. How did she do it? I mean, this was a time when a lot of men didn't travel on their own. For the detail that just uh, hooked me. So, my missy and see how it compared. I wanted to look at the 
the narrative arc of, of writing about women's lives and, and, and the, the place of women in society and how that's changed, in what ways it's changed and what hasn't changed. And actually traveling with a baby is a quite good way of exploring that narrative, the way in which women's lives are, are to a certain extent, have a, there's a greater impact on women's lives by the fact of reproduction. And so how on earth did she pull that off was, was one of my missions. But then actually, the more time I spent in her company and the more I learned about her writing and about her courage, the mission then became one to sort of rescue her from, from death and from obscurity because it increasingly struck me as a huge injustice that she's not more famous. Mm. Um, and yes, and the circumstances of her death are you know, very, very much fed into that. So that, that it struck me that um, another thing that I could do with, with my writing, so this is my book, Following in Her Footsteps, In Search of Mary, available from et cetera, et cetera. But you know, with, with a Scandinavian feature and I'm dragging a baby around. And I wanted to sort of, on the one hand, lower the bar to entry to Wollstonecraft and show that it's just a cracking reach, she's an amazing woman. And this is an absolutely blockbusting story. But also just, tackle the, the the sheer outrage of the fact that most people don't know who she is. Mm, absolutely, yeah. Well, because wasn't it Godwin who sort of, he reads her letters and then falls in love with her through the writing? So, yeah, it was actually this book, he says, he fell in love. Yes, he, he fell in love with her because of that. And, and, and to a certain extent, so did I. I yeah. completely get where he's coming from because it's, it's, a, it's a roller coaster read. I mean, much like Wollstonecraft's life itself, in sort of a few short chapters, it's, it's a headlong rush into a really quite extraordinary enlightenment mind. Um, she was, of course, an early architect of what we now call human rights. She's very widely known for her vindication of the rights of women, but I'm always keen to, to flag up a vindication of the rights of men, which came two years earlier when she was a relative nobody. Wollstonecraft penned this, and what it frames is the idea of humans as rational beings deserving of a, a book of rational thought, which informs the debate, you know, what we now know as, as human rights. She was there at the beginning of, of that thinking. Yes, and, and uh, Vindication of the Rights of Men is interesting, isn't it? Because she initially published it anonymously and then it sells out and then three weeks yes. later, she yes, it's a wonderful story, actually. So in 1790, she was still a relative unknown. She obviously had um, aspirations to be a writer. She was already, she herself, the first of a new genus. She was already at work with the publisher, Joseph Johnson. She, she published reviews. Um, she, she looked at works in translation. So she was already in that mix. And she was part of this wonderful radical dissenting community based in Newington Green, which is, which is where she kind of flourished and became herself professionally. She described it as, I am the first of a new genus, mm. this idea of living by the pen. Um, but it was, it's really, it's in, it's in this document that she, she becomes herself. And the text is amazing because she's experimenting with her voice, with her, na her own narrative voice. And she is, of course, going into battle with one of the huge authorities of the day. I mean, she's just a fearless writer. But this text is in response to Edmund Burke. Now, I've got on my shelf here, I've got a Wollstonecraft shelf. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is Wollstonecraft land. And uh, in, the, in the true spirit of, uh, was, it, was it Michael Gove who had some uh, extreme right-wing literature on his shelf? I do have enemies of Wollstonecraft here. And our old friend Edmund Burke is one of them. Mm -hmm. And it was Edmund Burke that she went into, into battle with because he had a pop at her great friend, Richard Price, who was uh, the dissenting minister at, in, in Newton Green. Richard Price was, of course, very sympathetic to the ideals of the French Revolution. Mm. Edmund Burke, not so much as the forefather of modern conservatism. So Edmund Burke had unleashed this very uh, long-winded and purple attack on the revolution and, and all its admirers. And Wollstonecraft was first off the track. She was the first to respond. We, of course, know Thomas Paine, uh, Rights of Man. Wollstonecraft got in there first. Her Rights of Men came out a, a mere six weeks after the publication of Edmund Burke's attack. And it's, it's really exciting to read because um, she spoofs him. She sort of adopts this very puffed up wah, 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 tone of, of Edmund Burke. She, she just shakes with contempt and she, you know, she pauses to smother her, her you know, she, she can't pour enough sarcasm and ridicule on him. But between that, there's, there's glimpses of pure enlightenment thought. I'll just give you a little blast. Um, and there's a very good reason why 
everybody in lockdown and everywhere else should be reading Enlightenment Rational Philosophy. <laughs> and this, is, this is the sort of distillation of her argument. It is necessary emphatically to repeat that there are rights which men, i.e. humans, inherit at their birth as, it, as rational creatures who were raised above the brute creation by their improvable faculties. And that in receiving these, not from their forefathers, but from God, prescription can never undermine natural rights. Ooh. So it's a little bit dressed up in 18th century ease, but it, that actually gives me chills. Because mm. what she's saying is, it's our improvable factors, it's the fact that we can engage and use our, our critical, use our reason to challenge an existing order, to look at the system of uh, the Ancien Regime, to look at a system and go, no, that doesn't work. I challenge that with my mind. And so, I mean, Wollstonecraft's entire thesis is that women are capable of reason and that all humans, women are humans. So it's a, a very deep philosophical position that she's taking, um, which I think really bears scrutiny today. We, we take for granted the idea that, that women and the black people weren't didn't qualify as humans. Um, you know, that, that seems so astonishing to us. Mm -hmm. And that's what she's challenging there. And it also contains a kernel of, and this is again, a, you know, part of her enlightenment thought, the idea that, that humans are a work in progress. She says improvable faculties. That's very much a reconnecting better. And there's actually a little extract in, in reckons in about sort of 50 to 60 years, I think it is, that, that human will be pretty much perfect. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> so going back to the travels and your travels, um, when you were abroad, were there, were there any moments when you felt particularly close to Mary Wollstonecraft and her writing? Oh, that's a really interesting question. There was a couple of moments where the thrill of the chase was so intense. I took one, one of my great inspirations uh, as a writer is, is the biographer Richard Holmes, who has done a lot of, I mean, one of his books is actually called Footsteps and I was attempting to do a similar footsteps things. One of the, the signatures of his work is that he goes to places that were meaningful to writers and sort of tries to soak up the vibe in a very intoxicating way. So when I was traveling around in Wollstonecraft's footsteps, there were a few moments where, in particular, there's one place and it's called Porto, P-O-R-T, an O with a, a line through it. And it's so tiny, it took me ages to find on the coastal map of Norway. It's just a dot, but she mentions it in her writing. And, and if I may, I'll just, I'll just come to her description of it because, um, and I've got a couple of photos, I don't know if you're able to share. Yes, yeah, so um, I can. It's very, very rocky. Um, and it's, it's, you come way up uh, between rocks. Is it this one? Uh, is it? Yeah, so this is the view from Porto and there's a couple of little wooden houses clinging on and uh, these are scaries, these, these, um, the rocks you see out to sea, but the, the, the coastline is, is terrifying and quite baffling. I mean, Norway itself as a country is just the most extraordinary shape. You take a look at it and this is one of the things that, you know, that I'm even more fascinated by in lockdown is remembering the fabulous places that I've been to and one of them is most definitely Norway. That coastline is just so so dense it's like a sort of if you imagine a very large long hairy blanket that covers over the top of scandinavia it's something like that and she describes it we sailed more amongst the rocks and islands than in my passage from strunstra and they often formed very picturesque combinations few of the high ridges were entirely bare the seeds of some pines or firs had been wafted by the winds or waves, and they stood to brave the element. Sitting then in a little boat on the ocean, amidst strangers with sorrow and care pressing hard on me, buffeting me about from climb to climb, I felt like the lone shrub at random cast. And so there's this, you, you sense the, the heartbreak that she's, she, she's managing at the same time she knows she's lost the man that she loves. She's out there in a foreign land on a treasure hunt with her baby and yet she's constantly distracted partly by, by, by the sublime nature of this huge immense wild landscape around her and this, this triggers a, a series of interesting reflections. Um, the very next day she writes again from the boat, the view of this wild coast as we sailed along it afforded me a continual subject for meditation. I anticipated the future improvement of the world she's always doing that, <laughs> and observed how much man had still to do to obtain of the earth all it could yield. 
I even carried my speculations so far as to advance a million or two years to the moment when Earth would be so perfectly cultivated as to render it necessary to inhabit every spot. Yes, these bleak shores. Imagination went further still and pictured the state of man when the Earth could no longer support him. Where was he to fly from universal famine? Do not smile. I really became distressed for these fellow creatures yet unborn. The images fastened on me and the world appeared a vast prison. I was soon to be in a smaller one for no other name can I give to Risa. It would be difficult to form an idea of the place if you have never seen one of these rocky coasts. So the image that we're sharing right now is actually a very gentle scene, but the rocks are absolutely terrifying. It's like a kind of kid's drawing, you know, like zigzag rocks bursting through these dark churning waters. And, and that's what she's dealing with. And where she mentions their resource, that's the scene of their final showdown with the captain that's done a runner with her boyfriend, Silver. So she realizes that, you know, the entire weight of the mission is, is pressing down on her and she's lonely and she's probably a little bit more scared than she'll let on. She never admits to any kind of fear whatsoever. But I think, you know, it doesn't get more frightening than being on a wobbly boat on the Norwegian coast on a crazy and demented treasure hunt. <laughs> Gosh. And, in, and her child is with her as well. This part of the voyage, she actually left uh, um, with, uh, the baby stayed with friends in Sweden. So they traveled together for the first part. She did the chasing along the Norwegian coast after Captain Peter Ellefsen and the final showdown with him. And then she comes back and rejoins her baby and they travel onwards to Germany. So she also travels with a maid. Um, so yes, I, you know, all of the journey that I undertook was places that she'd been to. They weren't all places that she'd been to with her baby. Oh gosh, but like with the showdown, sort of, how, what happened at the end of that? What was the sort of result? Spoiler alert, <laughs> they never find the silver. <gasps> and weirdly, Peter Ellefson, who was the captain that, that vanished with it, um, whilst in the end he won the legal battle that Wollstonecraft brings against him, he didn't end his days wealthy, which he would have thought he would. So there's still a lot of mystery around that. And there's, mm -hmm. you know, conspiracy flying around that, that Gilbert Imlay was involved in something very much darker, that there was, for example, um, smuggling taking, smuggling afoot, that he was, you know, bringing arms out uh, in, in from neutral Scandinavia into, into Paris, that, you know, all sorts of, and certainly the nature, the way that she talks at, towards the end, she starts quoting Hamlet, which is never a good sign, but she talks about <laughs> Fortunes. She references all sorts of very dark and dirty dealings and, and, you know, she becomes very bitter and very disgusted with the nature of the business in hand, which she doesn't reveal. Um, but it's all, it's all part of the sort of sensational, um, you know, the story behind the story, again, of, of this book. But there are beautiful, peaceful moments as well. And there's one in particular, which I adore. I think you've got an image there of Tunsberg, which is a, a lovely uh, Norwegian uh, a town in the south of Norway, which was actually Wollstonecraft's favourite spot. So this is the view from a hill in Tunsberg, which was Wollstonecraft's favourite hill. Mm. Um, it was a place that she was so delighted with. She spent quite a lot of time in Tunsberg. She made friends here. She settled down. She began to recover from her own recent attempted suicide and she recovers her health and she starts rowing in the sea. She goes and sort of model, models around with, um, with jellyfish and just has a great old time of it. Um, and I, I ended up just staying in, in a, a little youth hostel with, with my baby, Will, um, right underneath this hill, which was pure fortune. I only made the connection once I was there. I was like, oh my God, this is the actual place. So this was another one where I was so close. I was sort of hyperventilating with the proximity of where I was standing to where she writes these lines. Um, I'll, read, I'll read a little bit from, from my book, In Search of Mary, which sort of includes lines of Wollstonecraft's letters from Norway. Later in the afternoon, the rain stops, its absence suddenly audible. I seize the moment to go back up onto Wollstonecraft's favourite hill. I pop Will into his buggy and we barrel back up the steep slopes through the dripping grass. The birds are singing all around, also relieved by a break from the rain. I have to sit here for a while in Wollstonecraft's secret resting place. There's no one else around. The darkest clouds have lifted, but it's still misty. I perch on a large stone and gently bring out my copy of Letters from Norway and read some passages aloud. So this is Wollstonecraft. Here have I frequently strayed, sovereign of the waste. I seldom met any human creature and sometimes reclining on the mossy down under the shelter of a rock the prattling of the sea amongst the pebbles, 
has lulled me to sleep. But this, she then sort of segues into a, a slightly uh, darker section where she says, you have sometimes wondered, my dear friend, at the extreme affection of my nature, but such is the temperature of my soul. For years have I endeavoured to calm an impetuous tide. It was striving against the stream. I must love and admire with warmth, or I sink into sadness. And what she's referencing there is, of course, the very sort of tempestuous nature of their relationship and the fact that she tried to, to take her own life. And this, I must say, I mean, you asked about um, feeling close to Wollstonecraft on the travels. That was so hard to overcome. And I think um, anybody that really cares deeply about a writer who's, who's, who's taken their own life is it's tremendously painful when you're working around the, the parts of their writing that refer to that. Um, she writes just after this, thinking of death makes us tenderly cling to our affections. It appears to me impossible that I should cease to exist. Surely something resides in this heart that is not perishable and life is more than a dream. And then this is back, back to my book. Um, I sit for more long minutes on that stone in a deep, vague sadness. Will grabs out for the long grasses waving nearby. Eventually, I sigh out a long breath, and inside my head I tell her something. You haven't ceased to exist. Oh. And there are, there are moments of such poignancy in her writing. Mm. She, she suffers so deeply, and that was, I could accompany her to these tiny, tiny locations and be where she'd been and scramble up the rocks that she scrambled up, but ultimately she was so deeply unhappy, and I, I just couldn't cross that gulf. Yes. I mean, even just hearing those words and feeling emotional, which is so embarrassing because of course it's on no. the <laughs> Really, wow. I mean, that is the legacy, isn't it? To sort of know that she's still having an impact and moving people to this day. Oh. Absolutely, absolutely. And actually, again, this returns to the theme of, of the importance for me of writing this book was about, you know, restoring her to, to people's you know, wider sense of, of her standing in not in just only in literature, but in philosophy and politics. The most important part um, in illuminating the injustice of Wollstonecraft's absence from the canon, if you like, is, is her untimely and very cruel death. Mm. Um, I, I describe this as a, as a double death. Most people know that she died giving birth to Mary Shelley, the future author of Frankenstein. Um, that was cruel enough. That was fairly horrific in itself, it took her 10 days to die um, of a simple, I mean, a simple basic childbirth and, you know, a neglectful, you know, mistake of not, you know, people didn't know how to wash hands, she had retained placenta. It was an unnecessary and really stupid woman's death, uh, which is bad enough, but the worst part is what happened next. So she died at the age of 38, at the peak of her writing powers with an immense body of work just about to move into the political fiction. She was experimenting with different forms. She was bringing out work, you know, around education and early years education. She had so much to do. She finally found a decent guy, William Godless, so everything seemed to be smiling and a brief and Wollstonecraft. And he perhaps naively, although I don't hold it again, describes certain parts of her life that just brought around, there's no other word for it than a shit storm. It was just a gift for all her enemies. And you can imagine that she had, she'd annoyed quite a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And also we're about to tip, in, in historical terms, we're about to tip over into the Victorian era. Yes. And she just had no place in that, in that setting. So she was ripe to be held up as a figure of disgust, as a, as a cautionary tale of uppity women and hyenas in petticoats and all of that nonsense. Um, so she was savagely attacked um, in the press, in poems, in the various articles that were circulated, cartoons about her naked body. And it, this is a, a mis sustained misogynistic attack that went on not for months, but for years. Mm. And it was so toxic that she herself and her legacy became toxic and untouchable and ridiculous. And she effectively became buried and it wasn't for a good century until indeed the suffragist Millicent Fawcett actually began the process of uh, rehabilitating, if you like, her, her reputation. And it was Millicent Fawcett that said she was at the forefront of this struggle. She led this battle. Um, and since then there has been 
uh, obviously a, a much wider appreciation, but for me, not wide enough because she was, you know, she had her century in the wilderness um, of being written out and of being scorned. So it means a great deal to me that people know the name, that they know how to spell Wollstonecraft, that they know how to say Wollstonecraft and that she finally gets the recognition that she deserves. Yes, absolutely. I mean, poor Godwin does writes that memoir out of grief and actually turns so against the whole purpose and ideal of their both of their lives works it's just such a tragedy but with the work of you and others she's coming back into the fall which is great which leaves me with my final question why is mary wollstonecraft the perfect lockdown companion mary wollstonecraft is exactly what you want to be reading during lockdown and I'll tell you why. There's two reasons. One, it's great escapism. Naturally, this book, I would definitely go for the travels because in Letters from Norway, you get, it's, it's, it's one of the lesser known of Wollstonecraft's gems, but you get all of the politics of both of her vindications. You get the philosophy, you get the sort of scornful, caustic sarcasm, but you also get this kind of very beautiful, mournful, um, quite heartbreaking glimpse into her internal life. You know, you, you feel um, her feelings about her child, her feelings about herself, um, a sense of despair. Um, it's, it's an extraordinary piece of writing. And of course, you've got the whole juicy, juicy backstory that she, she only hints at. So that kind of heightens it and amps up the whole tension. But the other reason, and again, I'm very emphatic about this, that in this time of irrationality and people questioning facts and just people having alternate reality, you know, facts, I, fake news, I didn't want to say it, but there it just popped out. We should be reading Enlightenment philosophy. We should be, um, we should be cha championing the people who, who hailed humans as rational beings, as, as being, you know, as, as celebrating the possibility of being better, of, of deploying our rational faculties and of being improvable creatures, as she termed it. Oh. Wonderful. What a, what a point to end on. Yes, we, can, we are all improvable creatures. I love that. And we should aspire to her temperature of soul, as she said it, which is just so beautiful. B, thank exactly. you so much for talking to me. It's been lovely. Oh, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. <laughs>